Mr. Secretary, it's great to have you this morning. Thanks very much for being here. Maria, it's great to be with you this morning on this important topic. So I want to start with the U.S. sanctioning the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corporation uh, and two of its officials for their connection to the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Tell us about this company, its reach, why these sanctions are important in terms of moving the needle on what's taken place. Well, the, the risk to the people in that region has been great. I've talked about this as the uh, greatest human rights violation of this century to date. Uh, and what we've attempted to do is make clear to China, if, if you want to participate on the world stage, you can't engage in behavior like this. So uh, we've begun to impose uh, sanctions on the individuals and businesses involved there. This most recent set of sanctions put out by the Department of Treasury uh, will put uh, the businesses operating there on notice. They've got to change their behavior. They've got to stop using slave labor. They've got to stop participating in these systems that have been connected to forced sterilizations, forced abortions. These are, these are terrible terrible things that are taking place there and we're going to impose real costs on those businesses. This company is involved in the cotton trade and so has deep connectivity to Western businesses including those in the United States and we've been very clear. We've told U.S. businesses to take a real deep look into their supply chains. I don't think companies, uh, some brand names here in America, want to be connected to what's taking place there. Well, we, we mentioned the NBA. We were showing video as you were talking. This video was shot in 2018, but it clearly shows the Uyghurs being lined up, uh, blindfolded in some cases, being taken somewhere. Do American companies not understand what has taken place here? For example, the NBA, other companies that want to do a deal, want to get to Microsoft, wanting to acquire TikTok in a moment. Uh, but do you think corporations are getting the national security issues that you have uh, laid out over the last couple of years? Maria, I think they're starting to uh, become more aware of it, to be awakened to the challenges this presents to their brand, to their company, their supply chain. I think they're starting to see that. But as, as we've discussed before, I think all across the world, uh, for an awful long time, we didn't recognize the threats posed to freedom. Uh, the authoritarian nature of the regime there and so we uh, we let things go on that we shouldn't I, i'm very hopeful these businesses will evaluate what's going on and then make the right decisions for their businesses I, i'm confident that they will we we have news this morning that microsoft has put on pause its plans to acquire TikTok, the u.s operations of this video sharing app Peter Navarro was with us last week on this program. Here's what he said about TikTok. I've got to get your take on this very popular app for young people. Here's Peter Navarro. What the American people have to understand is all the data that goes into those mobile apps that kids have so much fun with and seem so convenient, it goes right to servers in China, right to the Chinese military, the Chinese Communist Party, and the agencies which want to steal our intellectual property. Those apps can be used to steal personal and financial information for blackmail and extortion. They can be used to steal business, intellectual property, and proprietary secrets. What happened with TikTok, Secretary? Well, here's what I hope that the American people will come to recognize. Uh, these Chinese software companies doing business in the United States, whether it's TikTok or WeChat, uh, there are countless more. Uh, as Peter Navarro said, uh, are feeding data directly to the Chinese Communist Party, their national security apparatus. Could be their, their facial recognition pattern, it could be uh, information about their residents, their phone numbers, their friends, who they're connected to. Those are, those are the issues that President Trump's made clear we're going to take care of. These are true national security issues. They're true privacy issues for the American people. And for a long time, a long time, the United States just said, well, goodness, if we're having fun with it or if a company can make uh, money off of it, we're going to permit that to happen. President Trump has said enough and we're going to fix it. And so uh, he will take action in the coming days with respect to a broad array of uh, national security risks that are presented by software connected to the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, even if Microsoft were to acquire the U.S. assets of TikTok, can you really believe that the China surveillance is gone from U.S. operations of TikTok? Maria, I, I promise you, the president, when he makes his decision, uh, will make sure that everything we have done drives us as close to zero risk for the American people. That's the mission set that he laid out for all of us when we get we began to evaluate this now several months back. We're, we're closing in on a solution, and I, I think you'll see the president's announcement shortly. 
Secretary, I want to ask you about FBI Director Christopher Wray speaking to the Senate Intel Committee uh, in the last uh, week, and he warned about China's increased capability to interfere in U.S. elections. Uh, saying that these were classified hearings to the Senate Intel Committee to this week, saying that China has developed an ability to interfere with local elections and target members of Congress to influence China policy. What can you tell us? Well, Maria, I don't want to say much more than you just described there. The rest of the information is classified. But make no mistake about it. I, I talked about this back in February to the National Governors Association. The Chinese Communist Party, and you, you saw this with our closure of the consulate in Houston, is running espionage operations inside the United States and attempting deep influence targeting of American business leaders, of American congressmen, of city council members. We saw it happen up to a state senator in Wisconsin. Uh, this is a, a deep effort to conduct influence operations to undermine American democracy and put our nation at risk. Uh, this administration, President Trump, for the first time, has said, "This is enough of this, we're going to fix this, and has given us all the guidance, and you've seen us act on it, whether it was what we did to the consulate with Houston, you saw the FBI uh, indict several uh, PLA members who were studying here in the United States, engaged in activity that was clearly unlawful. Uh, we're taking seriously this threat. We're going to protect the American people from these Chinese influence operations. Well, I mean, you, you know, this week, Dianne Feinstein praised China uh, as a respectable nation, she said. Why, why do some in Congress uh, not, not say the same thing that you've been saying that this administration has been communicating? There doesn't seem to be an all-out agreement within the Congress on this. Maria, I, I saw the statement from Senator Feinstein. I, I found it perplexing. I saw statements from senior American uh, CEOs of the big tech companies this week say they hadn't heard or seen about intellectual property theft in the United States. That, that's, that's crazy talk. Um, here's the good news. The good news is uh, we're getting nearly every member of Congress aligned along the administration's policies on China. When we voted about Hong Kong freedom, there were over 400 votes in the House and nearly every vote in the Senate. The same with respect to what's taking place in Western China, the human rights violations. I think the tide is turning. I think not only here in the United States, but all across the world, the threat from the Chinese Communist Party is becoming clearer and clearer. And nations uh, that are like-minded all across the world are beginning to come together to rebalance, to push back against this, to protect our freedom and democracy. I, I talked at the Nixon Library about this being a battle not between the United States and China, but between authoritarianism and freedom. That's the fight the world needs to be engaged in. I hope we get every member of Congress on board on the side of freedom. I mean, I was particularly struck by Dianne Feinstein because didn't she have a, a driver for 20 years that we ended up finding out was a Chinese spy? We, we did. You'll recall, she, she meets with some frequency with Foreign Minister Zarif there, too. There's something not quite right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this, well, is, not consistent. Keep this is not that, consistent. This is yeah. not consistent with America's yeah. national security. In either case, these are adversaries that intend harm for the citizens of her state of California. And I, I wish that she would not engage in this kind of rhetoric and these kind of meetings that undermine America's efforts. Yeah, there seems to be a new uh, angle here, and that is the Chinese Communist government trying to compromise certain Democrat members of Congress who are against President Trump. We'll, we'll keep watching that. I want to ask you about how China is using the new security law and what has taken place in Hong Kong now, Secretary, because Hong Kong is now delaying election, uh, its election for a year. They're talking about COVID-19 being the issue. Your reaction? Well, COVID-19 is not the reason for the delay in the election. The reason for the delay, there was scheduled to be an election in Hong Kong on September 6th. The reason for the delay is that the Chinese Communist Party candidates would be crushed and the freedom-loving people of Hong Kong would prevail. And the leadership in Beijing simply can't permit that to happen. Look, this is, this is part of what we're seeing happen all across the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. Increased denial of freedom for people in their own country and then extending that now to people outside of their country. That national security law can be applied to people all across the world. It has extraterritorial provisions in it, saying that someone who so much as speaks against freedom in Hong Kong has violated the national security law and is under threat from the Chinese Communist Party. This is, this is a new and increased scope and it's the kind of thing we've seen as the direction of travel from the Chinese Communist Party under General Secretary Xi. Mm. 
So, uh, I mean, do you expect an election ever in Hong Kong? I mean, in that speech you referred to uh, at the Nixon Library, you, you said that, you know, we are seeing the tide turn. I mean, you just said that a lot of our allies understand the threat. Do you believe the U.S. has alliances here? I mean, we know that India has banned those 59 apps. We know that the U.K. has come around in terms of not using Huawei for its 5G. Uh, we know what's happened in the South China Sea. What about Western Europe? What, what, you know, what about Spain and, and, and Germany and, and Italy? Uh, do you feel you've got the support from the rest of the world? Well, it's better than it was six months ago and increasing. I think the whole world sees this. It's not because America asked these countries to engage in activity that pushes back against the Chinese Communist Party that they ought to do it. They ought to do it because it's in their nation's sovereign best interest to do so, and we're seeing it, whether it's in the Czech Republic or in Malaysia and Vietnam, all across the world. Countries are right. coming to understand the challenges that the Chinese Communist Party presents and that the United States will be there, that the United States will be there to lead this push to ensure that the next century remains a free and democratic century, not one that is governed by the rules of the road laid down by this communist regime. Secretary, I want to move on to Iran. Because